Uh, today I'll be talking uh, with all of you about some, uh, some opening preparation. Uh, definitely a concept that there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about in chess. Some players say that opening preparation doesn't matter that much. Some people say it's, uh, <laughs> it's impossible to get high level opening preparation without a world class memory. You have to memorize, you know, encyclopedia length uh, books to get good opening preparation. Definitely none of that is true. It's definitely uh, possible to, uh, to develop a master level opening repertoire with a systematic method. Um, also, a lot of players overvalue opening preparation without really building up those fundamentals first. There's obviously uh, way more about opening preparation than I can talk about in a quick, you know, 20, 25 minute lecture. But I want to focus on something, uh, one method that I came up with to teach to my students called the tree and branches method to really diving deep into a main line of an opening, understanding the ideas thoroughly deep into the middle game, um, and then branching off, examining all the possible uh, deviations your opponent can throw at you once you really establish that main line. Um, and we're going to do this with kind of a case study for one particular opening. Some of you might be familiar with it. My guess is most of you probably won't be. I mean, even if you've seen this before, you probably haven't seen all the branches we're going to get into. Uh, so we're going to start with a Knight Orf Sicilian. And definitely we'll keep this pretty informal. If you have questions along the way, feel free to unmute yourself or type them in the chat. I'm happy to, uh, to help you out. Um, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with the Knight Orf, at least uh, kind of vaguely. Would you say that's true? So a an Nidorf, and the line we're going to be uh, covering today is this line with pawn to f3. This is a variation of the English attack here for white. Uh, White's plan here is simply to play bishop e3, queen d2, castle long, and then launch this kingside pawn storm after black castle short. So f3, we're going to be looking at the line where black plays e5. Um, sometimes black plays e6, but e5 is definitely a very reasonable move here, trying to kind of equalize space in the center, kicking this knight away. Um, knight b3. And now from here, both sides are just going to develop their minor pieces. And again, both players could play differently. We're going to really get deep into this main line, and then we can come back and talk about the branches. But I feel like a lot of players do that doesn't lead them uh, to really their full potential when it comes to opening preparation is, you know, they, they memorize the first six, seven, eight moves. Everyone kind of gets there eventually in their favorite openings. They read some books, they watch some videos, and then they keep trying to go one move deeper, one move deeper. And because of the exponential branching of how opening preparation works, it's very hard to build up a substantial knowledge base just trying to go one move deeper. It's much better once you build up that, that foundation of six or seven moves to just really examine a main line really deeply, understand all those middle game ideas, and then come back and look at the branches. So in this main line, bishop e6 should make sense, controlling this uh, valuable outpost here on d5. Bishop e3, white continues with his plan. Bishop e7. Queen d2, knight d7, castle long, castle short. So the stage is set here, right? Um, we see opposite side castling. Um, most of you probably know what that means, right? We're probably going to get to see some, uh, some pretty aggressive attacking chess. Obviously, with kings castled on the same side of the board, you can't just launch the pawns at the king willy-nilly because you're exposing your own king. Um, but with opposite side castling, you're a lot more free to launch those pawns forward and attack. And you'll see here we're on move 10. A lot of players think it's really hard to memorize 10 moves deep into an opening. Everything here is really just intuitive, right? We had a knight, a knight orf Sicilian, and now both sides develop their minor pieces. There's not much to really, uh, it, it's, it's not as hard to memorize this as you probably might think. Um, but it's more important to understand the ideas, and the memorization kind of comes once you really thoroughly understand that. Um, so we know the pawn storms are coming. Um, so, are we going to play games? What's that? Are we going to play games? Um... Probably not. I'm kind of going to just go through this and uh, we can take questions throughout the way. Um, but okay, here white can play pawn to g4, right? Getting this pawn storm started. b5, g5. Anyone have any ideas how black might respond to this uh, pawn to g5 move? So black could move the knight right away, but b4 is probably the most ambitious way to keep going. Uh, black marches forward with their own pawn storm. Knight e2, right? White has to save the knight. Knight e8. H4. Here comes the, uh, the second pawn into the attack for both players. A5. Uh, or sorry, not, not h4. Sorry, I got messed up there. F4. Usually white continues with the f pawn in this line uh, because you can threaten to trap the bishop. So f4, a5. F5, and once again, black can meet this with a counterattack. Black can meet this with pawn to A4. Again, they could also play bishop takes B3, and we can come back and look at the branches later. 
But I think this is a very uh, picturesque kind of situation we see here. Both sides really thrusting their pawns into this attack. We see attacks and counterattacks already. And white has a pretty surprising move here in response to pawn to a4. Um, I mean, if you take here, you could play that way, but then black gets to open up this file. But white has this very nice knight sacrifice, knight b to d4. Kind of a surprising uh, idea here, but the idea is if black accepts this sacrifice, which they kind of have to do, um, white's down a piece, but white's going to get it back. White has an attack here on the bishop still, and white also has another threat. Do you see white's other threat? Give you a few seconds to see if you can find it. But white's also threatening uh, knight to c6 here, forking the queen and bishop. Uh, so black really can't deal with both of these threats without uh, losing some material back. So after white's temporary peace sacrifice, black usually continues with pawn to b3, uh, temporarily stopping white from executing either of these threats because black has a serious threat of their own to play b takes a2 and make a queen. Um, a1 would be unstoppable. So king b1, b takes c2. Uh, the purpose here is just to open a line to the king and to deflect this knight. If you take with the queen, uh, g5 could fall in some lines. So knight takes c2. And now it looks like white has lost this threat to the c6 square, right? But they're still going to get their piece back because this bishop is trapped, right? This bishop is still attacked, and it actually has no squares it can go to now. Um, but black would like to sell it as dearly as possible. And again, try to be building this narrative of, as we go along this path. Uh, you know, we're, we're probably going to go about 20, 22 moves deep in this opening. But it's not that much to memorize if you understand the ideas of what's going on. We had a knight or Sicilian, both sides develop their pieces, opposite side castling, the pawn storm, and nothing spectacular happened until this knight d4 uh, surprise kind of tactic. Um, so black wants to sell this bishop as dearly as possible. They're gonna lose it no matter what. Usually they play bishop b3. Not bishop takes a2, that is a sideline, but bishop b3 ensures that this a file is going to open up. So that's why bishop b3, a takes b3, a takes b3, and white definitely has to seal off this a file with knight to a3. Uh, I think there's some uh, things in the chat. I can't see the chat and the board at the same time. Uh, it might be easier just to unmute yourself uh, if you have a question. Um, but knight a3, sealing off the, uh, the a file. Uh, black plays knight e5 here, improving the knight. Otherwise, bishop c4 could be pretty strong, really eyeing the king with these ideas, also going after b3. So knight e5. Um, what I would do, I would move the H pawn. Um, oh, right, right here for white. You could. Um, the move I prefer here for white is queen to G2. Um, I have Simply... a question. Oh. Sure. Yeah, Milana. Uh, like, can we, like, when we have, like, when you, like, I wrote knight D6 and knight A3 for, like, the answers for that. Okay. Yeah, Great. can I, like, unmute myself when I have it? Sure, yeah, yeah. If I ever like pause for a couple seconds and say, you know, do you have any ideas, feel free to unmute yourself real quick and, and say what you would play. Uh, okay. um, but here is kind of the final move of this 22 move sequence. Um, I prefer the move here, queen g2, um, simply threatening to play f6 and entrap this bishop. So we have this main line here, and my guess is just from looking at this, you probably understand some of the key ideas of how this system is played, even if these specific moves aren't played. Let's actually just go back to square one and try to quiz yourself as we go along this line. Try to see if you can remember the moves of this line. Again, the memory is not the point, but if you understand the ideas, it's probably not as hard as you might think to come up with the 22 moves here. So again, e4, c5, knight f3, d6, d4, takes, takes. Knight f6, knight c3, a6. This is kind of our starting position. I'll try to give you maybe a, you know, a second or two before making moves for white so you have some time to quiz yourself. But pawn to f3, that was the idea of the whole line. e5, knight b3, bishop e6, bishop e3, bishop e7, queen d2, knight b to d7, castle, Castle, g4, b5, g5, b4, knight e2, knight e8, f4, a5, f5, a4. Hopefully you remembered it. Knight b to d4 takes, takes b3. Hopefully you remember to stop the uh, making a queen. So king b1 takes, 
Knight takes c2, bishop e3. Takes, takes. Knight a3, knight e5. And finally, queen g2 threatening f6. So I'm just curious, go ahead and un unmute yourself. How, how did you do there? I think a lot of players I've done this exercise with are surprised that they can remember, you know, 15 to 20 moves when usually they can, you know, they only, they only play five or six moves from memory. Uh, to adjust I can remember 19 moves. Awesome, awesome, that's impressive. How, how many moves do you usually play from memory to begin a chess game? 10. Okay. How about you, uh, Milana, how'd you do? Um, I remember like five moves. Uh, you couldn't get past move five. Are you familiar with the Night Orb Sicilian? This yeah. uh, this system right here? Okay. Yeah, I, I always I mostly play it sometimes. Okay, you just forgot White's uh, White's English attack idea here of uh, of castling long. How about uh, how about you, Jeff Beer, Leon, Adrian, anyone else? How'd you do? I think you're on mute. <laughs> you got to hit the unmute button. Good. <laughs> Started to fight because I'm just a little bit familiar with the Night of Sicilian. Okay. All right. So we've covered kind of the the, the trunk of the tree, right? We've covered this uh, the, this trunk of the tree, this 22 move line. Um, and I, I get a lot of questions when I teach this approach to my students because they'll say, "Well, what if my opponent deviates?" Right. And that's kind of the next step. Once you put in this work to learn some of these ideas. You've seen how white tries to get to the king. You've seen white's pawn storm. You've seen how black tries to counterattack. Now you can really go back and ask those questions about what happens if black deviates at various points. Uh, so for example, here, we have this 22 move main line. Let's step back a move and say, okay, what if black doesn't play knight e5? Well, we kind of briefly talked about that. If they don't play knight e5, bishop c4 is just really strong. Uh, there's threats of g6 in some cases. This pawn could just fall. So there's no real great alternative there. Let's step back another move, right? After we take the bishop, can they really play anything besides a takes b3? Not really, otherwise their play doesn't make any sense. So no real, uh, no real branches of the tree to analyze there. Let's step back another move here. Um, after we take on c2, could they play anything besides bishop b3? Um, they could, they could. They could play this line bishop takes a2, right? That's kind of another way to sell this bishop as dearly as possible. So bishop takes a2, king takes a2. Um, and one of the key ideas of this variation is that you can bring this knight to b4 now and kind of activate this formerly passive knight, followed by queen c3, really taking control of a lot of the squares here on the c and b files, trying to stop those entry points uh, for black's attack. It's important here to control the b3 square so they can't just chase your knight away and kind of start infiltrating. Um, but white actually does pretty well in this position. White controls a lot of the key squares and it's not very easy for black to proceed with their attack. Uh, for example, here, knight c7, black has to kind of regroup uh, this knight that was kicked away and then just rook c1. And uh, once again, white controls a lot of the key squares. Even though their king does look kind of open, white still has attacking ideas of their own. So that's one branch of the tree. If black were to play uh, bishop takes a2 instead of bishop b3. Uh, stepping back a couple moves uh, prior, uh, so here, there's not really any alternative. Black really can't play much besides b3 because white's threats are so strong. Um, let's take a look at some of the more uh, you know viable branches black could throw at us, though. We talked about this moment here after pawn to f5. See if you can remember what black usually plays here. I have a question. When the, okay, uh, when the bishop was trapped... Black plays a4. Black plays a4. Yeah, Javier, what's your question? Can you play bishop c5 in the place where the bishop is trapped? Is uh -huh. bishop c5 variation in, in this position? In this position, could you play bishop c5? No, bishop c5 is illegal. This move, bishop c5? No, oh, I meant bishop c4. Oh, no, then we just take it. Oh. <laughs> Good question, though. I like how you're thinking, trying to free that bishop. There actually is a way where that can work if, if white uh, kind of falls for a trap. If white takes with the king here, then you can give a check on the c file, and then you can untrap the bishop with bishop c4. So white does have to be aware of that idea um, and not take with the king. But yeah, after white plays the correct move and, and takes with the knight, then bishop c4 does not work. 
But we were talking about this position right here after f5, or um, as Joey mentioned, uh, black does usually play here pawn to a4, uh, counterattacking this knight. But what if black plays bishop takes b3? That's definitely another very viable way to deal with this threat. Um, a lot of players might not want to do that with black because you really give up one of your best minor pieces, the guardian of this weak uh, d5 outpost. Um, but on the other hand, it does weaken white's king a bit. So let's take, take a look. Take it, take it, take off the f pawn. With the f pawn? C pawn. Yeah, c pawn. So <laughs> c, c takes b3. And in this line, usually black has to get to this king really quick. Black wants to get that counterplay before white's, you know, attacks, uh, attacking ideas become uh, very strong. So a4 takes, takes, king b1. And if black does nothing, white can just defend everything and play b3. This pawn might even fall. So black usually goes for this very forcing line. Black has a nice little tactic here. See if you see, see if you can see Black's tactic without looking over here to the right. See if you can think about what um, you know a tactical blow that it looks like Black has. It's kind of tricky to see if you haven't seen the pattern before. Um, it's kind of funny. It's based on a fork of the king and the h1 rook, which sounds kind of crazy from this position. But rook takes a2. Black sacrifices a rook temporarily, and then comes queen a8. And surprisingly, it's very hard for White to stop this threat. After king b1 comes queen takes c4. So we get this very forcing line, but it's not the end of the world for white. White does lose a pawn of material, but at the same time, this queen is kind of stranded far out of play, and now white can get their attack going with pawn to f6, thinking about routing this knight into the f5 square, especially because it comes uh, to g3 with tempo. So that's one alternative. Coming back here to this position. Oh, after... oh go ahead. Um, can you put like the queen back to like the h one? Uh, let me see. Uh, we're talking about this line here. You said queen to h1? Oh, I'm, well, yeah, to where, when it captures the rook. Uh-huh. And when the, um, the white piece, like, yeah, like that. Like, after, um, black moves, can you put bishop, can you go bishop to h or a? Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, that, that is one of White's threats. That's one of the reasons White played pawn to f6, trying to uh, possibly bring this bishop to h3 with this double attack on the knight and queen. Good job seeing that tactic. That's why often White isn't too concerned about this, uh, this tactic here with the whole queen takes e4 and queen takes h1 line. It's actually tactically pretty dangerous for Black because of White's f6 ideas, bishop h3 ideas, and the queen can be kind of a target. So yeah, good point. Uh, then coming back to this position here after f4, um, we talked about how black meets that with a5. I remember a long time ago showing this, uh, showing this opening, I think it was 2012 or 2013, showing this in a, in a tournament hall. And uh, there was one gentleman, I think he was rated about 1900, a pretty good player, but he was adamant in this position. He said, black has to play e takes f4. Why is anyone playing a5? Everyone knows this in the Sicilian. When white plays f4, you just take, and now you get this nice, out, nice uh, outpost here on e5 for the knight. So let's examine that idea. So what happens if black does play e takes f4 here? Well, we can play knight takes f4 and improve the knight. And the big downside here for black, if black were to do this, is that this pawn no longer controls the d4 square. And that means this knight that was kicked away is going to get access to a nice square here in the center again. So just to show one sample line here, black can go ahead and secure that e5 square for the knight. But OK, white marches on h4. Um, let's say pawn to a5. Uh, knight takes e6. And this pawn can even be a big target here on e6. Um, for example, bishop h3. And now what does black do here? It's not very easy uh, to see. If you play queen c8, for example, then probably just knight d4. And once again, this knight is kind of freed from its prison. Um, on queen d7, that's probably even worse uh, because now there's knight c5, a very nice kind of tactical blow. It doesn't really win anything because black wins a piece and white wins a piece right back. Uh, but just positionally, this is such a bad position for black. This e6 pawn is so weak, uh, the bishops are so strong. <clears throat> Coming back here to another branch. So after knight e2, uh, just to refresh your memory here, this is after g5, b4. Uh, we said that white has to save that knight. And where does the black knight usually go? Back to e8, right? You might have been wondering, why can't black bring that knight to the side of the board with knight h5? And that's definitely another line to consider. 
Um, the big thing about the knight on h5 is we can kind of go after that knight and use it as a target to try to open up this h file, which we know we usually want to do when we're attacking. So knight g3, knight f4, h4, a5, king b1, a4. And what do you think white might play here in this position? This same idea works, knight d4, this time based on a different idea. Uh, this time based, of course, on the loose knight here instead of the trapped bishop. But this is why it's important to go through this process, because a lot of these ideas build on each other. We already saw the idea that white can try to tactically justify meeting this pawn storm with knight d4, bringing the knight to a better square than some you know, passive square like a1. And it just so happens that here the tactics work out. But if you don't know to look for that tactic, you might not find it. So knight d4. Um, coming back here um, after g5, we said that black usually meets this with this uh, counterattack, pawn to b4. Uh, what happens if they don't counterattack and they move the knight right away? The big problem for black, if they don't counterattack your b4 knight and they just move the knight away right away, let's say knight e8, is white could play knight d5 in a position like this and secure this very nice outpost on c6. Uh, for example, after bishop takes d5, e takes d5, um, white has a very nice positional idea here of knight a5, knight c6. And it's actually pretty hard for black to stop. For example, queen c7, knight a5, and this knight's just going to get access to the c6 square. And this is another very common positional idea. And again, the memorization is not the main point. This one specific line isn't the only time this idea comes up. This idea comes up over and over again in this line, uh, playing knight d5, bringing a pawn to the d5 square, and then routing a knight to the, to the weak c6 square that black uh, kind of abandoned early on when they played this pawn to b5 move. Um, another possible branch, coming back here uh, to move nine after castles, castles, uh, we said black usually plays here, or sorry, uh, queen d2 instead of castling. Um, black might want to stop white's pawn storm idea altogether, right? Black sometimes plays this move pawn to h5, just stopping g4 because they don't want to come, uh, you know, under this heavy fire if they were to castle. And I've tried a couple different systems against this line. Um, there is a system where you castle long anyways, and you just have to play a bit more slowly because you can't play g4 too quickly. Um, these days, I prefer a system where you just play more positionally and try to make this pawn look dumb, try to make it um, kind of stick out like a sore thumb if you castle short. For example, bishop e2, knight d7, and again, a very quick knight d5, trying to bring a pawn to this d5 square. White's not going for the pawn storm. White's just playing positionally. Knight takes d5, e takes d5, castle short. And white can even expand here on the queen side. White can play knight a5. Once again, this same idea. Even though this b pawn hasn't committed uh, to b5, even though c6 isn't weak yet, this really freezes up the black queen side. How does black really proceed here, right? You can't really advance this pawn because you give away the, the c6 square. The pawn's under fire. Both bishops really bear down on the queen side here. So queen c7, c4, white expands, rook a to c1, b4. And I kind of feel like this is a nice way for white to just play very, uh, very positionally on this line. Um, even ideas like c5 later on trying to make a pass a d pawn uh, could be a very strong positional idea, right? Um, another branch here, we'll just do one more. So after queen d2, we're getting pretty early on here. This is move nine. Um, whatever we say black usually plays here. Black can just play knight b to d7 or castles, uh, probably in either order. Some players here try to break with d5, and in the Sicilian, this is very desirable for black. A lot of players just memorize, you know, the first five moves without really understanding them. When we, when we play the Sicilian, right, e4, c5, knight of 3d6, d4, white is voluntarily giving away a central pawn for a more flank pawn, right? White's trading away this d4 pawn for the c5 pawn. Why is white willing to do that? Have any of you thought about that? Because because you want the game more central, so if you take it, that if you take it, then you can just defend. Then yeah, so yeah, yeah. So in the Sicilian, White's usually wanting to blow the center open, like you said, because they want to get a lead in development, and they can do this because this move C five really doesn't help Black's development. It's kind of it's kind of strange. You learn these opening principles as a beginner that you have to develop really fast, and then you learn the most popular response to E four is the Sicilian which isn't a move that really opens any lines of development for black. It's not like e5 that opens up the bishop and queen. c5 is not really a developing move. 
So White tries to exploit that in the Sicilian by blowing the center open, but it comes at a cost because White's giving up their central pawn majority. We see here in the Sicilian, Black has two central pawns against one. And if Black ever could, uh, Black would like to blow the center open with d5, possibly advancing to d4 and kind of um, claiming the superiority in the center. But it's too early for them to do it here. That's the point of going through this branch and knowing this. So you, you're prepared if your opponent goes for it. If Black plays d5 here, they haven't really caught up in development enough to blow the center open like this. So we can just play the most forcing line. He takes d5, knight takes d5, knight takes, queen takes, 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 cast along with tempo. And white still has a very significant advantage here because of this lead in development. For example, after bishop e6, knight c5, black is going to be forced to part with the bishop pair. Um, knight takes e6 is a, uh, is a you know, very strong positional threat. That would leave black with these doubled isolated pawns. Knight takes b7 is a threat. And a position like this is very positionally bad for black. Just look at those dark squares. White has a dark bishop, black does not. They can't castle. And uh, white kind of has a dominating uh, position here. So that's why this, uh, this, this d5 branch here uh, is not so popular. So, all right, there, there's of course other branches we could go through too, but I hope you get the idea of this process. You really dive deep into a main line in one of the openings you're covering. And once you've established that main line, once you've done that work that so few chess players out there do, most chess players will never do this. They'll never come up with a deep main line, understand all the ideas deep into the middle game. But once you do that, you can really use this to make sure that almost every chess game you ever play can be used to strengthen and tweak your opening preparation. I'm sure you can imagine, right? If you were to go play a game in the Night Orf Sicilian, which is a very common opening, and I'm sure you'll, you'll come across it sooner uh, rather than later if you're playing E4 in the open Sicilian, and your opponent plays something that you're not familiar with, well, after the game, you can do some analysis there and add it right into your opening preparation file. You kind of have this secret weapon that gets stronger and stronger the more games you play, because every single game, you can look at that branching point, do some analysis, and improve your preparation based on the game. Any, uh, any, any questions on this so far? Because I feel like uh, you know, this is kind of a, a new idea for most players, so I want to make sure that I give you time to kind of uh, ask questions. No questions at all? You're all 100% sure you can do this? <laughs> all right. So we've talked about how to apply this tree and branches method within one specific opening. I'm sure that now, if you were to you know, have this opening in a game, you'd probably be a lot more confident than you were 20 minutes ago that you could handle the position pretty well. Now let's kind of zoom out and talk about kind of a bird's eye view of our opening repertoire and uh, kind of how to develop a master level opening uh, repertoire to be ready for anything our opponent throws at us. So like I said, a lot of players get intimidated. They, they see a big book like the Encyclopedia of Chess Openings and think, okay, I could never memorize all that. There's really a very manageable number of, of, of categories, or I call them buckets, um, of opening preparation that you have to do. For example here, if we're playing E4 with white, what are some very broad categories of openings that we have to be ready for? Feel free to unmute and, and start saying them. I'm, I'm sure you know some of them. E4, D4, Knight, No, 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 no. We're, Yeah, we're playing E4. So what, what are the defenses we have to be ready for if we're going to play E4? Knight F6. Okay, D4. that's one. The Alakine, it's not a common one. E, E4, E5. E5, that's a big one. D5. Yeah, the Scandinavian. Um... Yep, knight c5. The Sicilian, five. right? The French. The Caro Khan, I think we're up to five now. Uh, the perk defense with d6. Yeah. And there's some minor ones, you know, the modern defense. And, uh, and, and uh, f, f5. No, you don't. No, no one plays that. <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever going to play f5. Uh, but you see, I know there's someone who does. Well, they shouldn't. So there's only about eight categories here, eight or nine categories of openings you have to learn if you're going to play E4. It's, it's not this infinite list of, you know, a thousand different, uh, you know, pages of an opening book that you have to learn. If, you, if you're going to play E4, there's only about eight broad categories you have to learn. And within each of these categories, there's probably only going to be a small amount of subcategories. For example, here after E4, E5, E4, E5, what are some of the subcategories here? If we're going to play Knight F3 and go into some of the main lines. Black can play the Petrov defense, right? That's one. Play the Philidor defense. And as a Roy Lopez player, 
I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with this, uh, the, the Rui Lopez. I would, I would kind of uh, break down Black's defenses here. All as right, I would make that. that. If, if, okay, so if he made that move, I would go D4 right away before I move that bishop. Yeah, that, that's another line. That's the scotch opening. Um, but I'm talking about the Roy Lopez. As a Roy Lopez player, I would kind of break down Black's possible defenses here into their own kind of buckets. You know, you have the Berlin defense. That could be your third bucket in addition to the Petrov and Philidor. Uh, A6, the bird defense. So there's really only about seven or eight sub buckets in each of these buckets. And we said there's only about seven or eight buckets to start with. So if you multiply there, what does that leave us with? Maybe about 50 to 60 uh, kind of sub buckets there to cover with white. And that sounds like a big number. That sounds like a lot of, of buckets to, to kind of work through. Um, and it is, it is a lot of work to develop a master level opening repertoire, but it's also not an insurmountable task. Just think that over the next year, if you spent one week each on each of these, you know, 50 buckets that would make up your opening repertoire, really doing what we just did, establishing a deep main line for that bucket, you know, what the most popular line is, and then spending the rest of the week going back and examining all the branches, um, playing some practice games in the line, adding in whatever you learn when you're analyzing the game into your analysis file, you would really start to develop a comprehensive opening repertoire that would cover everything uh, your opponent could throw at you. So this is how it kind of comes together. You would start with this high level bird's eye view, kind of a table of contents for the work you're about to do, going through this bucketing process and dividing your opening up into these 50 or 60 buckets. And then inside each of these buckets, you do exactly what we did at the start of this video. You examine that deep main line, you thoroughly understand all the ideas. Now you have to have a very strong background in tactics, calculation, positional play, pawn structures uh, to make use of that. And that's where a lot of players go wrong. They try to, they try to jump right into this opening preparation stuff and they've never done um, any serious work building up their pattern recognition um, uh, as far as tactics go or understanding pawn structures. So many players below 1800 uh, have major gaps in their understanding of pawn structures, which, which, which makes it very hard to plan and to assimilate these uh, kind of patterns in all these openings. But once you get those basics down, um, I mean, it's a very, a, a very kind of uh, systematic way to develop a master level opening repertoire. Break it into buckets, there's not too many of them, and do this tree and branches method within each of those buckets. And I guess with that, I'll open it up to, uh, to questions. No questions? Okay, so thank you, Blake. Does anyone have questions? So how do you guys prepare? Maybe I should ask that question. How do you guys currently prepare for your openings? So those of you that are online, so how do you prepare for your openings? Uh, who wants to share? Does anyone want to share? How do you prepare for your openings? Do you have a particular opening that you play all the time as white? Do you have a particular opening that you play as black? Um, do you go down this, uh, this road memorizing lots and lots of lines and all the different variations? So I have a few people here that say they play E4. So Adrian plays E4. Okay, so Adrian, if you play e4, then you have to be ready for all the five to six openings. So you, you're probably ready for French defense, for e5, for, for Sicilian. So that you have to be ready for a lot of stuff. Yep. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, so sometimes I do, so some people play Italian, okay. All right, so so Blake, uh, so one of the things I, do you recommend players, uh, because I, I, I think this may make sense for some players sometimes, 
do you recommend players to just master one particular opening? So for example, if you play E4, mm -hmm. you have to prepare for all these different lines. You have to prepare for E5, you have to prepare for against E3, uh, C5. Is there an easier way or, or, or do you think players can just look for an opening, maybe play G6, uh, Bishop G2, sorry, play G3, Bishop G2, and that way they can come up with similar positions uh, no matter what Black does? I don't recommend that because I think that really stunts your growth as a chess player. You're, you're not going to see many different types of middle games, pawn structures, tactical patterns. If you're always opening every game with, you know, G3, Knight F3, Bishop G2, or uh, a lot of players' favorites these days, the London system, right? That's kind of been a big thing sold to, uh, to cl club players these days. Say, hey, you don't have to memorize openings. Just begin every game with D4, Bishop F4, Knight F3, E3, C3, Bishop D3, Knight D2, Castle, and you can ignore all of Black's moves. And <laughs> you, you, you can certainly play that way. And a lot of players get pretty good playing that way because it is very hard to blunder when you can play 10 moves on autopilot. But I see so many of those players get stuck at the 1500, 1600 level because they've never really put any systematic work into uh, understanding positional play and understanding different pawn structures, weakness identification. Um, uh, and another thing is E4 openings are by and large a lot more tactical. And I think a lot of players get frustrated um, playing some of those more ambitious uh, open positions as beginners, you know, intermediate players. And that's when they switch to one of these system openings and they're really just covering up a giant flaw in their chess game. If you're, if you're losing all your games because of, uh, of tactical blunders, the answer is not to just play openings that, you know, brushes that under the rug. You really have to address that head on and work on that if you want to make it to that next level. Um, certainly covering it up can, uh, you know, pay off in the short term, but it's not going to pay off in the long term. Um, now, that's not to say that openings like the London system or Knight F3 and G3 aren't fine openings. Certainly, very good players play them. But I, I think most players who play them are playing them for the wrong reasons, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense.